welcome to Sunday Morning Worship back in our building here in Newport Pagnock. Our service today is led by Faith Holding, and we thank you, Faith, for that. Please be seated. Good morning. The Advent call is a call to a journey, <clears throat> to follow a star wherever it leads, to wait in suspense for new revelation to journey in hope, confident of God's leading, to believe that the heavens can open, to watch for an unlikely birth, and see beauty in the dirt of a stable. Amen. Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So we come together again in community to worship together on this second Sunday of Advent and we're going to reflect on Advent and on candlelight in our first piece of music. It's the words and music of the candlelight.
is a bit of a challenge where we're, we're spoon fed of having the words up there, but sometimes the challenge of actually listening to the detail of the music adds something different to it. We might have to do that for the rest of the music as well, we'll see how we go with the tech. But first, let's spend some time on prayer together. We're going to spend some time, first of all, with prayers of thanksgiving and then leading into prayers of approach and confession. So let us pray and focus on God. God of guidance, thank you for the lives of the ancient prophets, for their example of courage in giving unpopular messages to the people, for the beauty of the language of those whose words foretold the coming of the Messiah. Thank you for the lives of people in our own time who by their words and actions give us messages from you. We think of Martin Luther King who showed us that all races should be equal. Mother Teresa who showed us that we should care for the poor and dying. Scientists who warn us of the dangers of neglecting our planet. Please give us insight to discern true prophecy and listen to it. Strengthen us by your Holy Spirit to act on the messages of truth and speak out for you. We pray for these things in the name of the greatest prophet of all, Christ the true word. Holy and righteous God, we do thank you, prophets, who see your reality. And we thank you for the insight of teachers who guide us in your ways. Help us to understand your will for the world. And forgive us when we fail to see it. Holy and merciful God, we thank you for your saving hand. Help us to trust you more, to commit ourselves to follow the example of Jesus Christ and help us to let go, to trust in your love and to be the people you want us to be. Holy and tender God, let us rest in your love. Give us the gift of knowing that we are loved. Knowing it not just in our minds, but in our whole, in the whole of our being. For everything we do comes from that security. In it we can leave ourselves behind and become part of your goodwill for the world. Holy God, righteous, merciful and tender, Strengthen us to do the right thing. Make us more eager to do right than to be right. Soften our hard hearts. Inspire us to return curses with blessings. Be in our eyes when we look around so that we see you in all things and all people. For you are the one God. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And we long to live in constant knowledge of your presence. Amen. Now we're going to hear the first of our scripture readings this morning. We're going to hear from the book of Isaiah. reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every 
valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, Cry out. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fade, because the breath of the Lord grows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid, say the cities of Judah. Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young. And this is the word of the Lord. Thank you for sharing those words with us, Peter. And that first reading, of course, taken from the Old Testament, tells of the times of one of the first main prophets, Isaiah. And it's the prophets who are represented in the second advent candle on the candle tree that eventually got lit this morning. Now, having said that that second candle represents the prophets, the wreath itself is symbolic. It is a means of telling the Christmas story. And there are a number of different ways of understanding the symbolism. And I think there's a, a danger of the advent wreath coming a, a little bit of a habitual occurrence that you can pull it out of the, um, the cupboard at the end of November, put it all together. Um, but I think it's also worth taking time just to reflect on what this is. It's not just a habitual occurrence, it is a story. It's a story with symbolic meanings, but it should be remembered that the exact meaning given to the various aspects of the wreath is not as important as the whole story that it's trying to tell. So, the, the first thing is, can anyone tell me? I've forgotten his name, I'm so sorry. Ivan. Ivan. Ivan, can you tell me what colour the leaves on the Advent wreath are? Green. They are 10 out of 10. They are absolutely green. Do you know why they're green? Because. Because I wrote them. Because, because, because. They are green for a reason. Yeah. And the reason is that it speaks of the hope that we have in God. It's the hope of newness, the hope of new life, the hope of renewal. Now, most, most Advent wreaths tend to be circular. And the circle represents God's eternity. It's his endless mercy that goes on and on without, without end. But <clears throat> we are, after all, United Reformed Church, we're non-conformists, so we can do things differently at times. And Newport Pagan has got a square wreath. But there's symbolism in that as well. You can still have the circles because the, the candles are circular. So you can still have that symbolism in the minute. But the, it's a square. Is it, well you can, is it a square or a triangle, the shape of it? Square. It's a square. It's a square. And in, it's another bit of the Bible where Paul is writing to church and he talks about how Jesus has come from everybody. Yeah. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter if you're Jewish, it doesn't matter if you're Gentile, it doesn't matter if you're 
slave, it doesn't matter if you're free, whoever you are, from whatever corners of the world you come to, you are free. And there's that wonderful hymn, in Christ there is no east or west, in him now nor yourself. And so you can take the square as being symbolism that Christ calls us, God calls us from every corner of the earth. And then, of course, we've got the candles. And the candles symbolise the light of God coming into the world through the birth of his son. And those four outbound candles, can I have a counter, Ivan? I need to know how many candles there are on the advent wreath. Can you come and count them for me? One, two at the front. How many at the back? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And one in the middle. But the outer ones <laughs> I love the bar choir. We're going to hear you in a minute. Can you just hang on for a second? Oh, they just want to hear them. Tell me. We will hear them in a second. Right, so there are four candles on the outside and they represent the 400 years, the four centuries between the last prophet and John the Baptist. Um, and the colours of the ring, the colours of the candles, that fair is generally in most URCs that I've been into, we don't pay a lot of um, credence on the candles, and most of them do tend to be red. But in the, in the Anglican Church and Catholic churches, it's very important to them that they have different colours, which all have their individual symbolism. <clears throat> The, the light of the candles when they're eventually lit, and they've got a good flame going on them now, <clears throat> that reminds us, do you want to listen to this bit, Ivan? Because yeah. <clears throat> you, you mustn't touch it, but you can see the light from the candles, can't you? Yeah. yeah. Well, that light reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world, and that light comes into the darkness of our lives. Yeah. But it also, it also challenges us, challenges us, well, let me TV on in a minute. But it challenges us to be a light to the world too. A way that we can reflect the grace of God to others. And one of the things that I, I love in the Advent wreath, and it's one of the symbolisms that just really speaks to me, is the way as we go through Advent, we light more and more candles. So we do the one, then the two, then the three, then the four. And that's that when the light started to come into the world, so it grows, it progressively gets bigger and bigger, and we've got that sort of the anticipation that there is more to come. It's symbolising the darkness of fear and hopelessness receding. So the first candle is generally the candle of hope, of God coming to the world, and then the next three, I don't, what do you normally do at Newport Pagnor? What's your, because there are different ways of telling the story. Do you normally have hope? Ah, so you do Hope, Mary, John the Baptist. That one. Do you have the Magi in there as well? Yeah. Okay. Okay, just so one of them is Hope, John the Baptist, the Magi, and Mary. That's one of the symbolism. You can also have Peace, Joy, and Love. Uh, Bethlehem, Shepherds, and Angels. Um, or the Prophets, if you've done it, the Hope, the Prophets, John the Baptist. Uh, and so, and then, and then Mary on the last one. Are you going to come and help me? Yeah. Good. I like having helpers. Yeah. Can you hazard a guess, Ivan? I know it's a big ask of you, and it doesn't matter if you don't know the answer. There's one that there's one candle in the middle. Have you got any idea at all <laughs> who that represents? That one in the middle. <laughs> who do you think it represents? I'll give you a clue. It's not Ivan. Yeah. Who do we come to church to think about? Jesus. Jesus. 10 out of 10. You're doing well today. Is the, middle table, the middle candle is the Christ candle. And it's that central location that means, reminds us that Jesus' birth is at the heart of the season. And it's Jesus that's giving light to the world, fulfilling God's promise. So thank you. Thank you for your help, Ivan. That's brilliant. There are cups, aren't they? But mustn't touch the cups. Are you doing some colouring at the back? Yeah. Do you want to go and do some more colouring? And yeah. then I can come and see in a little while what you've been colouring in. Yeah. Brilliant. So that second candle, second Sunday of Advent, traditionally reflects on the role of the prophets. 
And so what I wanted to do this morning was use the traditional carol of the Father's Love Begotten. However, the best version of that I can find doesn't have the verse about prophets in it. So I thought we'd have a, we'd have a compromise. I'm going to read the words of the verse that refers to the prophets, and then we will, it will be their moment, we will hear the beautiful voices of the bar choir singing at Winchester Cathedral. So the verse that they miss out says, This is he whom seers in old time chanted of with one accord, whom the voices of prophets promised in their faithful word. Now he shines, the long expected. Let creation praise its Lord evermore and evermore. Verses of love of the Father's love begotten. Janice, I think, is going to now share with us our New Testament reading.
So <clears throat> it's the second Sunday in Advent, when, as we said, we traditionally the second candle on the Advent ring is used to symbolise the ancient prophets. And we're going to use the lectionary readings that we've heard to help us reflect on the nature of prophets. Prophets both past and present. Prophets can be unpopular. Prophets come in many guises. And prophets challenge the way that we think and act. The link between to the today's Gospel reading and that from the Old Testament is obvious, with the same words echoing back and forth between them. Prepare! <laughs> prepare the way of the Lord. And from there, Mark takes us straight into John's preaching in the wilderness. John the Baptist is a ministry which takes place against a background of a rogues gallery of kings, politicians, and religious leaders. The time when the promised land had been <clears throat> governed by God's appointed ruler, inhabited by an independent people, that had long gone. Good day, Mommy. Gentile leaders, puppet kings, ruled the country. And although the Jewish people lived in the promised land, their hearts were still in slavery. <clears throat> the last prophet, Malachi, lived in the 5th century BC. And so it was some four to five hundred years since there had been a word from the Lord I got it. <clears throat> into this troubled situation. John the Baptist, a new fearless prophet, appears on the scene of Israel's history. And throughout this history, the prophets had warned Israel that rebellion against God would result in disaster. The prophets had repeatedly called for repentance, and John calls rebellious Israel to return to the Lord. The demand for baptism, usually unexpected of Gentile converts, is now expected of the Jews, a sign of just how rebellious Israel had become. For the Jewish people, there had been an echo across the centuries of a great message. A great message of hope, forgiveness, and healing for the nation after the horrors of exile. God, they heard, <clears throat> would come at last. He was going to come back. He was going to bring comfort and liberation. And now John is saying, that's happening. And that is happening right now. It's time to get ready. God is coming back. So get ready for God's kingdom. The prophet speaks in urgency to a corrupt land and a broken people. And in so doing, he fulfills the prediction of an earlier prophet. And that earlier prophet, of course, is Isaiah. And Isaiah also lived in troubled times at a pivotal point in his nation's history. The second half of the 8th century BC saw the rise of the written prophecy in the work of Hosea, Amos, Micah, as well as Isaiah. But it also saw the downfall and disappearance of the greater part of Israel, the ten tribes of the northern kingdom. Following the death of King Hosea in 740 BC, predatory Assyrian kings dominated Judah and Israel. Now their ambitions were for empire, not plunder alone, and in pursuit of it they uprooted and transplanted whole populations, punishing any sign of rebellion with prompt and hideous reprisals. In the midst of tyranny and corruption and persecution, the prophet held firm to this, his confident belief <clears throat> that the Jews had a destiny that God called them to fulfill for the world. Isaiah was sure that the sordid present would be replaced by a glorious future for Jerusalem. Isaiah's vision of a better future, well, it may have brought hope to the Israelites, but it wouldn't have been greeted with joy by those that he criticised. The arrogant, hypocritical leaders, the 
foreign leaders who plotted to overthrow Jerusalem's rulers and occupy their land. Prophets can be unpopular people. Yes, there, Mummy. Now, I know that Jenny Mills has taught you about her experiences when she went to Israel and the Palestinian occupied territories in the autumn of 2019. She went as part of the, the URC's educational visit. Others who went on their visit have, have also shared the stories that they heard and the things that they saw. And that's been happening in church fellowships, churches all across the country. And as a result of sharing those stories, the words that call for change can be very unpopular. Whilst most people, most people seem to respond to the shared stories with a, a deeper understanding of what it now means to be a Palestinian living in the occupied territories, others responded with anger, with incredulation, and with opposition. Who's paying you to spread and repeat this rubbish? Is the type of retort that the URC representatives have been confronted from, with, from within the Christian church, from within our denomination? When new information threatens deeply held convictions and understandings, or reveals that past allegiances have now unwittingly place someone on the side of the oppressor rather than the oppressed. It is understandable why people try to defend their viewpoint. If someone has witnessed the devastation and horror that the suicide bombings by militant Palestinian groups during the Second Intifada in the 1990s and early noughties caused, it is hard to now see that community as victims of oppression. The 25 foot high separation barrier that divides Israel from the occupied territories was built as protection from such attacks. But now it serves to imprison all who live within its shadow. And it's not just prior perceptions and experiences that can close the mind to a prophet's words. Two of the greatest obstacles are wealth and power. If prophecy compromises these, then the deafness and denial can be profound. For evidence of this, just look at the resistance from some quarters that Greta Thunberg has experienced in recent years. I doubt that she ever has been or ever will be on Donald Trump's Christmas card list. Prophets can and arguably should provoke unpopularity. The prophet sees the current time and the vision of a better world if things were done differently. Our aching planet is suffering from the effects of climate change, but we have the, the voices of the aged prophets such as David Attenborough, as well as the voices of the young ones like Greta Thunberg, to point us to a better future. Prophets are not restricted to the ancient world or to old bodies. The young are a powerful force. It is just over, so much has happened this year that we're all sort of, COVID occupies almost all of one's thinking and certainly news headlines. But it is only just over a year, it's a year and a week, since the world lost two young prophets at Fishmonger's Hall in London. Jack Merritt and Saskia Jones saw not just the problems of our current society, but also how to build a better world by doing things differently. Now, I do not know whether either of those young people had any form of faith or belief in the divine. But I do know that their belief in the inherent goodness of humanity, their passion to rehabilitate through education 
and their drive to get alongside the marginalised in society shows that Christ was walking with them. I do not know if Jack Merritt's family have any form of faith or belief in the divine, but I do know that his father's heartfelt plea that Jack's death must not be used to perpetuate an agenda of hate, and that we should all borrow his intelligence, share his drive, feel his passion, and distinguish hatred with kindness, shows that God's love and grace are alive within him. Prophets can be young as well as old. John the Baptist was probably only in his 20s when he took up a frugal way of life in the Judean wilderness. With prophetic zeal, he preached a new message. Line descent from Abraham would not guarantee salvation. Only an act of radical repentance in which the whole of one's old life was washed away would suffice. To change the world, you must change yourself first. How hard it is to serve God who asks us to repent and change, how much easier it is to justify ourselves and demonise those who are different. We want politicians to reassure us and people to make us feel good about ourselves. It's harder to embrace those who like John the Baptist, like Jack Merritt and Saskia Jones, like Greta Thunberg, who call us to change our ways of thinking and the way that we live. But it is only if we are challenged, if we are made to feel disturbed, that we will change and can then work to build the peace that Isaiah longed for. Rescue the marginalised that the Learning Together Prison Programme works with and heal the created world that Greta Thunberg is fervent about. Prophets can be unpopular. Prophets can be young as well as old. And prophets should challenge and change us. When we are challenged and changed, we will walk more closely with God and then there will be hope for the world. The hope for peace and justice and hope for creation. If we doubt that we have the power to change the world, take note of the title of Greta Thunberg's book. <clears throat> no one is too small to make a difference. If we doubt that we have the power to change the world, be inspired by Jack Merritt and Saskia Jones' passion for politics of love and their tireless work in dark places to pull people towards the light. And be reminded that the world was changed beyond measure by a young man who started life as a helpless baby, born amidst livestock to a poor, unmarried teenager. Amen. And so we pray for our world. And our prayers of intercession focus on the theme of Advent, and include periods of silence for personal reflection. Christmas is coming. Keep watch with the housewives. <clears throat> Already she's afraid of Christmas. Afraid the money won't last. There's been little of it any this way this year. Afraid the children will be disappointed. Afraid of family rows, afraid of being tired, afraid of it all being too much. Pray for her. Hear the words of the angel. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will be for all people. Christmas is coming.
coming. Keep watch for the young people. Already he's in overdrive, buying luxury presents for those who don't need them, filling time whilst working from home. Christmas exposes his emptiness. He has to keep running. In case the message gets through to him and he sees himself as he really is, lonely and scared and very small, pray for him. Hear the words of the angel, don't be afraid, I bring you good news. That will be for all people. Christmas is coming. Keep watch with the old people. Already she's fearful. It's such a lonely time and it goes on so long. Christmas Eve, and excited families that normally gather at home but whom she will only see on Zoom tonight. Then it be TV and a cup of cocoa. Christmas Day, and they promise that they'll leave lunch on the doorstep for her. But what she really wants is company. Christmas night, memories, regrets, and feeling useless and lonely. Pray for her. Hear the words of the angel. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will be for all people. Christmas is coming. Keep watch with the clergy. Already she's anxious, all these expectations. Carol services to put on YouTube that are supposed to recapture people's innocence and nostalgia. Sermons that are supposed to send a thrill down people's spines. Bonhomie that's supposed to make, make her a cross between a TV host, Father Christmas and the Pope. And then that other anxiety. What will happen when the church opens next year? It'd be emptier than ever. More excuses to think of to cover the sense of failure. Pray for her. Lord, may Christmas be good news for millions of your anxious and tired people this year. Help them hear the words of the angel. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will be for all people. May the angels sing for them. May Christ be born in them. May your love come home to them. much in our services and orders of service that have to change to comply with the world that we are living in at the moment. But it is right that we also pray and offer the gifts, the financial gifts that are still being made for the work of the church and the gifts of the spirit that people are using every day. So let us pray. God the Father, you gave the world your being in the gift of Jesus Christ. And we respond by giving a little of the things that we have. Lord Jesus, you gave the world your life, and the world took it and tried to destroy it. We respond by trying to share your word and way so that the world may truly know you. Holy Spirit, 
Breathe into our hearts the desire to share generously of all that we have and are, that your people may know you better and your world become the kingdom and creation that you desired from the moment of its birth. Continue to pray, whether it's in your head or spoken behind your mask, to share the words that Christ taught his friends of every age to pray as we lead into our time of sharing of bread and wine. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. This day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so we come to remember. Christ's last meal on earth <clears throat> and pledge anew our commitment to him. Now, due to the current guidelines, and the distribution may take a little longer than usual. <clears throat> and when we come to share the elements, we will need to retain them and then consume them together at the same time. Um, and it might be helpful to reflect on sharing the bread as a symbol of the shared fellowship here at Newport Pagnell and then reflect on sharing the wine as a symbol of your shared faith journey. Continue with the narrative of the institution. In the same way, he took wine, and having given thanks for it, he poured it and gave it, <clears throat> gave a cup to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new relationship with God, sealed with my blood. Take this.
and share it. I shall not drink with you next in the coming kingdom of God. So now, following Jesus' example, we take this bread and this wine, the ordinary things of the world, through which God will bless us. And as Jesus offered thanks for the gifts of the earth, let us also celebrate God's goodness. God is with us, and we give thanks and praise to God. Loving God, the world you made is beautiful and full of wonder. You made us with all your creatures, and you love all that you have made. You gave us the words of your prophets, the stories of your people through the generations, and the gathered wisdom of many years. You gave us Jesus, your son, to be born and to grow up in difficult times when there was little peace. He embraced people with your love and told stories to change us all. He healed those in pain and brought light to those who had lost hope. He made friends with anyone who would listen and loved even his enemies. For these things he suffered, for these things he died. And he was raised from death and lives with you forever. You give us your Holy Spirit to teach and to strengthen us, to remind us of Jesus Christ and to make us one in him. For all these gifts we thank you, and we join with all your people on earth and heaven in joyful praise. Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. praise you that we are here today around the table of Jesus. We have heard the good news of your love. The cross is the sign of your arms outstretched in love for us. And the empty tomb declares your love stronger than death. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit upon this bread and wine, and upon your people, that Christ may be with us, and we may be made to, ready to live for you, and to do what you ask of us today and every day to come. We make this prayer through Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the love of the Creator, one God, to whom glory and praise forever. The body of Christ given to you.
blood that Christ shed for you. blood of Christ shed for you. Christ invited us to his table and we have shared with him there. We have been fed and renewed to go out and do God's work in the world. And so we're going to reflect on the words and hear the music of Now Let Us From This Table Rise. And it's a different tech combination. So hopefully we will have the words and the music will be via the digital hymnal.
as God is with us, through Jesus called Emmanuel. May God be with you as you leave this place. The child born under occupation, who up to show the world the way of peace and to bring light into the darkest of places. Take with you the hope that the birth of Jesus brought to the world and use that hope to light the darkness of our world today. And may the blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with those you love and with those that you find hard to love. Now 